Without God, everything is nothing. That's a series that we've been on in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, we're going to cover a little bit broader area of ground today, uh, starting with Ecclesiastes 9, verse 13, and go through chapter 10, verse 20. And we're talking about famous last words of fools, <laughs> of a fool. Uh, this is interesting, but as we can continue to follow what uh, Solomon is revealing to us here in the Word of God, we're trying to cover each area and glean from those scriptures everything that God has for us. You know, foolishness is something that we're all familiar with because we live in a world where people really, really do strange things. Uh, more so in these days that we're living in today than we've ever seen before. Not only do people do strange things, but people also sometimes say strange things. But uh, realizing this, now we look at it not only on a world or level of society, but we look at it also from the element of the spiritual today. And even in spiritual levels, we too also do foolish things. So we're living in a society when people are acting both legally and morally foolish. And, uh, you know, we have seen things happen that we never thought would ever, ever we would encounter in our society. But, you know, we live in a world where anything goes. Our efforts to disobey God and to think that we can get away with it makes, it, makes absolutely no sense. God keeps a perfect record, and he knows everything about us today. So Scripture tells us that God will give wisdom liberally, as James describes, and, uh, and, and he gives it to those who ask. I'm glad the word says, you know, ask and you shall receive. But it seems more people are drawn to folly than to maturity today. They're chasing the things of the world. They're chasing the pleasures. They're chasing all the foolishness of this world that has absolutely no eternal value. This is the theme of Ecclesiastes 10. And, and as we're going to see, Solomon reminds us that a little foolishness in your life can destroy your life altogether. I mean, it can wreak havoc from that standpoint. Just before Solomon introduces us to the subject on foolishness, he reminds us about a parable in life in the final verses of chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes, starting with verse 13 through 18. It says, This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and a few men within it, and there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard quiet, among, uh, quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Now, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9, 13, let me just give you a capsulization of that, that the wise are usually ignored while the foolish seemingly receive the accolades of society. We live in a world today where basically it seems that the wise are ignored and the foolish are promoted. Now, in this parable, and this is what he is giving here. You know, often we think of parables only in the New Testament. No, uh, Solomon actually used this uh, to, to disclose something to us. Uh, the lesson is people do not honor the wise because folly is more appealing than wisdom. Why is that, Pastor? Because people are pursuant to things of the flesh more than pursuant of the things of the Spirit of God. And you know, that's really uh, unusual that we, knowing the Word of God, would pursue foolishness over the things of the Lord. But it happens in the ranks of Christians, and we have to be very careful that we're not world chasers, but today we're God chasers, that we desire the Lord. Now, moving into Ecclesiastes 10, starting with verse 1, it says, and this, listen, <laughs> this kind of starts off a little wild, if you would. Dead flies. Boy, did you know you were going to come to church this morning and hear about dead flies? Well, <laughs> dead flies causes the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly 
uh, him that is in uh, reputation for wisdom and honor. Now, have you ever heard that phrase, a fly in the ointment? And you know what that represents, right? It means it destroys. It, it removes the value. It, it makes it putrid that you can't use it. And Solomon's saying this, this tiny insect, the fly, can ruin an expensive bottle of perfume. And likewise, a little foolishness can contaminate wisdom and honor in your life if you're not cautious and careful about how you live for the Lord. You know, we pull from the world things into our life that does not develop us but destroys us. So we have to be cautious of that. One foolish decision, one foolish deed, one foolish act of compromise today will cause uh, all of your honor to vanish. So, I mean, you can build. And Have you ever seen people that built a reputation for God and on an act of foolishness after years of building character and reputation and, and honoring the Lord and they slipped away from God and went into the world and they destroyed everything that God had built in their life. We have to be cautious of that. Warning today, it's the little things that can lead to great downfalls. You know, the word describes that. And he talks about little uh, foxes destroying the vines and talking about those seemingly insignificant sins that we sometimes commit that we think, well, there's no big deal. Any sin is a big deal in God's eyes. And there's only one solution and one cure for sin, right? And that's the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness that he provides. So be careful of ignoring the little compromises that sometimes will happen in your life. A little compromise in your life can trap you on a road of folly that you get locked into stuff. You know, if a person's an alcoholic, well, just one little drink won't hurt. Yeah, well, one little drink leads to another. And, and, and things of this nature, uh, dabbling in the things of the world is not going to lift you up. It's going to pull you down. So realizing that, he goes on in Ecclesiastes 10 and he says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Now, Solomon is giving us a translation here, and he talks in ways sometimes that you've got to look in the underlying meaning of what he is trying to portray here to you. The way of God on the right and the way of the wicked are on the left. Now, to the ancient Jews, the heart referred to the control of your life. And realizing that the heart would be the place of deep conviction within a person. I mean, conviction falls on our heart. When we got saved, what does the word say in Romans? He said, with the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But also we realize that the heart is also the place of conviction. Have you ever sinned against God? I'm sure we all have, right? But, right? Amen. And... Uh, but when you committed that sin and you knew you shouldn't have done it and there was the presence of conviction that fell on you, you felt like, man, I'm just dirty and this is something a shower can't wash off. This is something that only the blood of Jesus can remove as 1 John 1, 9 tells us. And so you felt like, man, I can't get in touch with God. I, my life seems to be off track. It just seems like I can't. I can't get my bearings and my focus right. And finally, you come to the place, I need to get restored to the Lord. I need to get cleansed. I need to get forgiven of the sin I committed. And boy, when you did that, it just seemed like the heavens opened and God lifted the burden. See, that conviction, that's a process that God puts in our heart. And, and you can be thankful for that. Because if you can sin and not feel any conviction of it, something's wrong with your salvation, right? I mean, realizing today that when we, we sin and God convicts us, we ought to praise God for that because that's a, a proof, if you would, that we have a relationship with the Lord. So Solomon was saying, the heart will direct a wise man to the things of God. And the fool is driven to foolishness. So therefore today, you know, when you're chasing the world, and, and it's just not what King David said in the Psalms about the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. Oh, listen today, if we are living today a life that is foolish and a life that is self-centered and a life that is world-controlled, we too are living foolishness. 
and living foolish today. So a foolish person is driven away from the things of God and a wise person clings to the things of God. You seek after righteousness. You hunger after it. You just can't get enough of God. Then Ecclesiastes 10 and 3 says, Yea, yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Now, Solomon's saying you can spot a person who is foolish by the way that they live. So, you know, it's not like they're walking around with a sign with an arrow pointing down to themselves and saying, you know, I'm a fool. Um, the way they live their life and the recklessness and the carelessness and the disregard of the things of God basically today declares they're living a foolish life. Now, there are two ways to live, right? You can live a foolish life, which a lot of people in the world are living. And I hate to say this, but a lot of Christians fall into foolish living because they get their eyes off of Jesus. And the second way to live today, a walk in the wisdom of the Lord. And this is just not a one-time thing. This is a daily seeking for the wisdom of God. You, you find wisdom by being in God's word, right? You find wisdom by praying. You find wisdom by attending God's house. You find wisdom by uh, centering your life on the things of God. So how can we walk in ris wisdom rather than walking in the process of folly? How can we make sure that our heart is committed to God? How can we know that we're staying with the stuff, as the fellow said? It's those little compromises that will destroy your commitment to God. And it's not like you got up one morning and said, well, I think I'm just going to go out and live foolish now. No, it was a subtle process. It's a gradual pulling and tugging away. And Satan will put those little vices of enticement in front of you and those little things because he, he knows what you like in life. He knows your weaknesses. And he wants today to capitalize on your weaknesses so that today you will follow his way rather than God's way. So Solomon gives us basically uh, three examples or instructions today in how to overcome folly and to be wise and to stay wise. It's just not being to get to the place of wisdom. It's staying in the place of wisdom. And the first thing he talks about, because this is very important, is to be competent with your leadership. You say, well, preacher, I'm not in positions of leadership in life. I, you know, my job is not a position of leadership, and I, I don't really possess a position of leadership in the house of the Lord. And, you know, I, I, I'm not involved in my neighborhood or my community. I have no leadership there, and I'm just a plain person just going through life. I hate to tell you, you have a position of leadership. All of us do. So verse 4 says, If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. Leadership exists at every level of life. Every one of us are leaders. Whether it's in our home, whether it's in our job, whether it's in our church, whether it's in our community, wherever at, we all are leaders somewhere in life. So all of us have a degree of leadership and God expects us to exercise that degree of leadership. Now, part of avoiding foolishness is being competent with the leadership that God has given you. How do you be confident with leadership that God's given you? It means you take it seriously. It means you give attention to it. In verse 4, Solomon describes a leader that, that basically shouts and screams to, to get their way. Have you ever worked in a place and worked for someone who was a shouter and, an, and a screamer or an intimidating type person that, I mean, you know, man, you dread going to work because this jerk, I mean, he or she was just intimidating to you and you could make a wrong move or make a mistake if they was just not over top of you screaming and shouting and you was biting your lip and putting your hands in your pocket so you wouldn't punch, punch the jerk in the mouth and get in trouble and lose your job. Y'all have been in those situations. I got any? <laughs> I see those hands. Amen. Well, I, I think we all have to some degree. Amen. But uh, realizing that this type of leader is one of two things, or both, insecure or self-exalting. You know, um, I'm of the opinion today, a good leader is a person who will never ask someone to do something that they wouldn't do themselves. 
You know, to show by example. Uh, there are many who lead by intimidation. And that does not get you anywhere. If you have someone that tries to bully you in leadership, and that's what happens, uh, then composure, and doesn't it get hard to be composed when someone is breathing fire and brimstone down your back and they have plucked your last nerve? I mean, you're about ready to just pop the cork on them. But how do you deal with these offenses? And it's hard to be composed. It's hard to walk away sometimes, isn't it? Man, that thing right there called the mouth, it gets engaged. And brother, it's like a, it's like a freight train going down a railroad track with, with full steam ahead. No controls on it. You can't always control. And see, this is what happens to us sometimes. We think that we can control what people couldn't do. You can't control what people do. Today, you can be competent in controlling yourself, though. See, we're not out to control people. We need to make sure that we are where we should be in our relationship with God. I've always found this. If you'll get your relationship right with him, you can keep your relationship right with other people. That doesn't mean that you don't pop off the cork sometime or people offend you or people make you angry, all those things. God never said in the Bible that anger is a sin. It's when we respond in anger that it becomes a sin. So it's, it's, we've got to be careful how we respond to angry people. I found my theory is this. If, if a person is irate and angry and you can't deal with them, I said, you know, come back later when you can compose yourself and talk civil and act like you got a brain. Well, I don't say it that way. But anyway, because that adds fuel to the fire, does it? But anyway, you know, let's just table this for a little bit. Let's both get our composure and come back and talk intelligently. And let's pray about what God would have us to do. I found that works a whole lot better. I've dealt with irate people on both ends of the table. So it's important how we respond to those that are leading and those who are uh, directing us in life. Going on in, in verses 5 through 7, I've got to hurry here. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceeded from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the, the rich set in low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes uh, walking as servants upon the earth. So it's not always the most qualified that ends up with a job of leadership. Have you ever worked in a place and all these things that are imposed by government and everything, and you know you were or somebody else was, was much more qualified for the position, but because of governmental constraints and because of all these other crazy things or favoritism or whatever the case is, that find that person, they don't know how to get in the house out of the rain, but they get the job. You know, we have to have an open mind to listen to also different points of view. Uh, let me say this about leadership. Anytime you're in leadership, you're always going to be under the position of being challenged. And sometimes we take that personal, but we shouldn't. Strong leaders will allow themselves to be challenged. You know, I found a smart leader will listen to someone who knows more than they do and listen to their leadership, and God will direct them. So now we go on in Ecclesiastes 10, 16, 17. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the sons of nobles and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So in those two verses, Solomon focused on the level of what we call maturity. Oswald Chambers, who has written just scores of, of great encouraging material, said this, spiritual maturity is not reached by the pressing of the years, but by obedience to the will of God. And how true that is. When leaders do not know what to do. They will use that position sometimes for their own pleasure, for their own benefits, and, and, and basically misuse what they have. Real leaders do not abuse their position. 
They lead according to their responsibility because leadership brings responsibility. Now going on in verses 18 and 19 is the result of poor leadership. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth and through idleness of the hands of the house droppeth through. Now, have you ever seen a beautiful uh, ornate building and because it was not maintained and because it was not taken care of and all of a sudden the paint is peeling and the, con the, the foundation is cracking and, and the shutters are falling off. You know, you drive through neighborhoods and you see houses like that that people don't take care of uh, and, you know, and they become slowful. Well, you know, you got to watch your life because you can become slowful in your living too. And going on in verse 19, he says, a feast is made for laughter and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. So Solomon uses example of a building that is decaying and Solomon leads us to the question, what makes a home worthless? And you know, there's a lot of houses that are beautiful on the outside, but on the interior, the quality of the home is in shambles by the people that live in the house. I don't mean, I'm not talking about the walls are not painted or the carpet's coming up, or whatever. I'm talking about the quality of the living in the home with the family. Solomon leads us to the question then, you know, about this thing, what really makes a home worthless? The primary is a homeowner who refuses to take care of the home. And so that's just not in the physical element, that's also in the spiritual element. A leader will never be successful by only looking out for themselves. Have you ever worked someone, for someone and man, all their work was about them. It's about putting them to the top. They could give a rip about you. They, they'd uh, kind of like the mentality, you know, they'd throw you out of the bus and then back up and run over you. You know, <laughs> you ever met somebody like that? Yeah, I know. Listen, home decays, families decay, relationships decay, churches decay, careers decay. I mean, the, the list is endless today. There will be decay in leadership that only looks out for oneself. So learn to lead with all of your ability in the place where God has put you and let God do the leading today. Now let me just put it this way. It's a privilege to lead and we should consider it a privilege. Leadership will go well when the focus on their responsibility today is, is there and not on the privileges from the standpoint of what is in it for me. Be competent with your leadership because leadership can go to your head. You know, the person that used to work next to you, man, they was a great guy until they got a little promotion and now they're a supervisor or something like that. And all of a sudden, what happened to them? I mean, the old person checked out and the jerk checked in. Right. Amen. Then second, I'm just dealing in practical measures here. Be careful in your labor. Going on to eight and nine. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. So don't go out and dig a pit today. No. And whoso <laughs> breaks, uh, breaketh uh, the hedge, then the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stone shall be hurt therewith, and he shall cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. So many of our problems is the result of carelessness, right? Wisdom not only affects how we think today, but how we lead, but wisdom will affect today then how we work. And in the examples of these verses, we must be careful in all of our labor as far as what we do. So good old fashioned common sense today goes a long way in getting the job done. And that's just not in the workplace, that's in the living place today. Wisdom affects how we think and now it affects how we work. Verse 10 says, if the iron be blunt and he do, uh, do not wet the edge, then must he put it to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So wisdom has the advantage of giving success and we've got to use it in that capacity. You will work twice as hard if you fail to make preparation. That's the old adage, you can work hard or you can work smart. <laughs> And, and to walk in wisdom, you've got to make preparation. And especially in your spiritual life. That is the process of salvation. But it's just not in salvation. It's then maintaining your salvation and living for the Lord. I'm not saying you lose it. I'm saying today you need to develop it. Amen. 
You must spend time in God's Word. You've got to talk to God in prayer. And you need to counsel from uh, people who are seasonal believers today. I mean, great wisdom. That's great wisdom in this room of people who have lived for the Lord. And, you know, we need to gain from their wisdom. Hard work without wisdom will only frustrate you today. Then verse 11, surely the serpent will bite without en enchantment, and a babbler is no better. <laughs> this guy is amazing. Be careful in your labor today because overconfidence will get you killed by a foolish decision. You know, I, I've known people that are bike riders, and when they think they can really ride the bike, that's when they, the bike winds up riding them. You know, and you've got to be cautious. I'm talking about, you know, uh, motorcycles. Yeah, not, not your little swin bike. I'm not. You got a swin? Okay, well, be careful on that too, Jack. Wear your helmet. Amen. We don't want you to hurt nothing. Amen. Then thirdly, be conscious of your language. Blunt but true. Don't let your mouth get you in trouble. Verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Solomon warns about the foolish use of the tongue. We, we all have the problem of talking too much sometimes, don't we? Mm-hmm. You say, yeah, preacher, you sure do. Amen. But <laughs> if you're not careful, your tongue can do more damage than anything else. Workplace, home place, church place, any place. Your tongue can get you in trouble. Sometimes you can open your mouth and insert your foot. All right? We, we can talk too much. Sometimes we can say too much. Solomon says we are to speak encouraging others today. That we're to speak encouraging words to other people. Has anyone ever hurt you with their words? Let me see some hands. Anybody ever hurt you with their words in life? Sure you have. Who hasn't? That's part of living. Welcome to life. This should impress on us that you know not only what people say to us, but what we say to them. Because you know what? Probably all of us also have said something to somebody and hurt them in life. So it's just not on the receiving end. Sometimes it's on the giving end. Words can consume you. Words can destroy you. So be conscious of what you say because today you can do more damage than you could ever imagine or think. When you are tempted to say an unkind word or gossip, let me just give you the, the best way to do it in one word. Don't. Don't do it. But man, my tongue gets flapping preaching. I can't control it. You better bridle it. Amen. Amen. I mean, bridle that thing. Be conscious of what you say than what you don't say. You know, be, be cautious today from that standpoint. 13, 14. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is mis mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? So, uh, have you ever met a, a self-appointed expert on everything? Yeah. I mean, man, they know everything about everything, and you can't tell them anything. And so you think, man, don't say nothing. Don't, don't say nothing about anything to them because, laws, you're going to get it, you know? Uh, <laughs> Proverbs 10, 19 says, he that restraineth his lips is wise. So verse 15, the labor of the foolish weareth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. So have you ever met someone today that it takes them 30 minutes to tell you what they're doing? I mean, you ask a simple question. You ever met somebody, you just say, hey, you're doing? And you think, God knows, I'll never ask them that question again. <laughs> Jesus have mercy. I just got everything from the time they came out of the womb to the moment that they are standing before me. I mean, I know every ache and every pain of every joint, of every situation, of every problem they faced. And the man never asked that person, hi, how you doing? <gasps> Lord have mercy. Verse 20 says, curse not the king. That's good to come and laugh, isn't it? Curse not the king, no not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird in the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. So 
What this is saying is this. Don't ever say in private what you would not say in public. You never know. Walls sometimes have ears. Jesus brings us in focus here as I close. Matthew 12, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So if you can control your tongue, you can control your life. Amen. But if you can't control your tongue, you're going to lose control of everything. Amen. Your tongue is the mere expression of your heart. Therefore, the course of our life is determined by the wisdom or the foolishness of our words. So your language reveals your heart. Be careful how you speak. The final last words of a fool is this. There is no God. And if you don't know Jesus, you're living in darkness, you're deceived, rather than living in the light, because thank the Lord you can still come over to Jesus today and he will give you a new life. Amen. That's the wisest thing you can do in life. And boy, when he gets in your heart, he'll get in your mouth. And you can speak his goodness to others today. And the church said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Haven't we had a good time with us this morning? Some good informative information that will enrich our living for the Lord. Thank you, Father, for an opportunity to enter to your house with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, to magnify your holy and righteous name, and to praise you today. Thank you for the wisdom that we receive from your word. Thank you that, Lord, we can live as wise people and as not as fools. Help us, Lord, to choose our words that they're always orchestrated of the Spirit of the Lord, that they will glorify you and bring good to others. Now, thank you, Lord, for your presence today. May all that is said, done, and accomplished in this house today magnify, glorify, and exalt your righteous and holy name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's servants said amen as they clap their hands and give praise to the Lord.